Hello, my name's Amanda and this is Suddenly Autistic, the video diary where I'm talking about my experiences and the realisation of finding out you're autistic um, later on in life, I suppose. So I found out at the age of 46 and I'm now 48, nearly 49. 49 is kind of like, seems like a weird age really. I'm not really, like it's, yeah, I think I'd rather just be 50. It's like nice and round, but there you go. Um, so that's the backstory and in this particular video I want to talk about my autistic, well, my working life and obviously, maybe not obviously as I'm autistic, it's my autistic working life um, because you've not got to read many statistics to realise that or to understand that people on the autism spectrum do face challenges, um, getting a job, keeping a job um, and being employed or working, contributing in the working way in a way that suits and um, sings to their to their um, assets and their capabilities and reaches, you know, to allow to allow people to reach their potential. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about today, and I'm doing it here in my laboratory because this is my work. Yay! I wanted to do a little bit of research I wouldn't call it research really it was very very little <laughs> compared to what I usually do but I wanted to look and see if I could find something that um, that had been put out into the universe in this country about autistic um, individuals and their work um, and, and attitudes to to work or their employment status um, I found a paper um, entitled Australians Attitude and Behaviour Towards Autism and Experiences of Autistic People um, and Their Families that was published on the 28th of March 2019 and this was a report um, for the group Amaze. Um, Amaze um, are, have a website and their tagline is Creating an Autism Inclusive Australia. This is this was a small study. Um, I'm not sure what whether it's particularly useful in the grand scheme of things. Certainly not where I hope the conversation around autistic people in the workforce goes in the future. It was only published in 2019. Might have said 2009 before. I don't know, but 2019 it was published. So that's not that long ago. And in terms of research papers it should still be relatively re um, relevant, relatively relevant. The thing, I think I'm stumbling a bit because I'm trying to be professional and that's probably a bit of a mask because it doesn't really matter. I'm not at, it doesn't matter anyway, I'm here. It doesn't matter, this is work. So that I'm, I'm getting my words a bit mixed up because I'm trying to be precise and right as opposed to just natural and normal. But I'll go back to this. The Amaze study was done, it was completed and published in, well, it's, it was published in 2019. I don't particularly, um, I think the things have gone on so quickly now with our understanding of autism over the last few years that some of the questions that were asked, some of the ways the survey was conducted, um, definitely the panel size, the panel size was very small, um, might um, lead to this type of report being actually discarded. But it's out there, it's on the internet, it was the first thing I found, so I'm going to talk to it. So please take it as a bit of information, a snapshot in time. Some of the things might or might not be, it may or may not be still relevant. But but first of all, I'm going to start off by going through some of the key, the key findings. So um, I picked out the group, the, the, the section on community attitudes and behaviours towards autism. Um because I think this is this is really interesting and this isn't what autistic people feel of themselves this is what the community is feeling on behalf of or for autistic individuals and the key findings from this report were 75 percent of the Australians um, in the survey believe autistic people struggle to gain employment um, most people I think one of the criteria for being in this study, I think, was, um, if I remember rightly, was um, you have to have a relationship with someone with autism or be autistic. So, you know, this is a this is a um, an expert type of panel. So, seventy five percent thought there was accepted there was a problem or, or um, communicated there was a problem. Um, seventy percent of Australians believe employers should make adjustments for autistic people, which you know, if these are people who are invested in the cause, you would hope that that would actually be closer to 100% maybe, um, 
maybe is is all I'd say. I mean, seventy percent is pretty high, but um, I don't I don't think anybody would accept a workplace um, discriminating um, or not. Ugh. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of examples, as I say, it's the trouble. Every single word I say, there's a thing in my head going, but what about this? What about that? It would be harder to accept that figure of only 70% of Australians believe employees should make an adjustment for autistic individuals if we were talking about individuals in wheelchairs or hearing or vision impaired individuals, of which autistic people can also be. But those visible or those more tangible disabilities um, are I don't think 30% of people in this survey would have said no, even if it was just because they would have felt that was the wrong thing to do. So I think that's quite telling in itself, but maybe not for the reasons that it's immediately, you, you might immediately think. But anyway, that's that. 21% of people would be more likely to shop at a supermarket with a proactive policy of employing autistic people. Now, I found that really peculiar as somebody who is autistic and who doesn't like supermarkets. So this is where my brain went with that. It's like, what? I'm autistic. I, I would hate to work. I don't even want to be in a supermarket. I like going to my little one, and I know what I want, and I get it, and I get out. And sometimes I might browse a little bit. I might check a few different aisles. But generally, that's only if I'm doing a deep dive research into some other type of biscuit to buy. It's a thing. But I don't want to work in one. And that wouldn't really, nothing against working in a supermarket great you know whatever but it's not for me so I'm reading this for me and thinking wow actually that's, that's still <laughs> is that low 21% would be more likely to drop a suit I just thought the question was odd which might become more apparent why later I don't know but it just seemed an odd thing to put in a survey how did they how did they even ask that question I could have looked maybe but I didn't because like I said I didn't really do research I just pulled something off reddit and went oh and then did this one in five Australians would be very slash concerned if an autistic person was appointed as their boss one in five that's 20 percent that's fairly significant and that is more upsetting to me personally because I am the boss I'm the boss of me in my own business sure and that's nobody's gonna get upset about that apart from me and I I'm, believe me I do get upset about the fact that I'm my own boss because I'm sometimes great at running this show and sometimes not and it would be so nice if there was someone a little bit more consistent running this show that is my business but there's not so I make allowances for her who's me and we I do the best that I can my autistic me and the boss me that society would prefer I am patently aware that there are lots of people out there who would be absolutely annoyed, upset and frustrated and disappointed to find out their boss was autistic. My question is, why? What aspect of it? What do you imagine that would look like? How would you imagine working towards that being less of a problem for you and potentially for your boss? Is it because in your mind that the autistic boss might present you with problems or that you might have to do more work because of them to pick up for their deficits? Is it because you feel something else maybe that you don't think you'll be able to get on, you won't have any common ground, whatever? What is going on behind that question? That I found very upsetting. The supermarket one I just found a bit of a weird question. But, you know, these are, these are key findings in this report around community attitudes. 24% of Australians would expect to receive training about autism if one of their colleagues was autistic. Hmm. I don't know how to feel about that. I've been in workplaces. I have, I have worked in facilities that aren't just my business so I have worked with other people in teams been part of a team and the teams have where I've known I'm autistic I have shared that with people I found personally from my personal experience I found those interactions after people realized I was autistic 
to be more open. The communication was more open and honest and there was more pausing and clarification and we were able to get things done better than the alternative which is actually everyone just assumes that everyone else is an arsehole if they're not doing what it says on the tin which who who tells you what it says on the tin well that's the boss who hopefully isn't autistic because god knows what they'll get us to do so again this question 24 percent of people in australia would like to receive training about autism if one of their colleagues was autistic well again what a weird thing i mean yeah great but only so what's that one in four ish okay fine that would be nice but training in autism or a chance to get to know your team worker your manager your offsider your subordinate whatever it is I don't know what they were getting at there but I think there is a huge difference about a company investing in training about autism in general versus making an autistic employee manager temporary staff agency person feeling more comfortable I don't like the saying if you've met one more person with autism you've met one person with autism because you don't need to say the word autism in that if you've met one person you've met one person sure there's traits and things that are similar in the autistic community and in the allistic community but you don't treat people the same just because they're a person. You don't know what's going on. People do now tend to talk more about their mental health issues, about the neurodivergence, about other aspects of their life. But that doesn't mean they always will or that they will straight away. And and they're no, they don't have an obligation to in a lot of workplaces. And, and even if there's no difference available or understood by that person at that time it doesn't mean that communication and everything should be you know sweet and plain sailing and you can just treat everybody the same treating different people the same is the same as treating people differently you know you one of the things I might be going on a rant here but I, I have studied teaching I have my um, graduate certificate in, in education in science education but one of the things that I did pick up on was that a good a, a successful teacher a professional teacher a professional educator gets to know know your students and how they learn and how to teach them like work work through how to teach them whether that happens or not in schools is is or educational environments is by the by that same however that same philosophy should go for every person in every social interaction know the person you're interacting with and together form a relationship build a relationship around what you're willing to share what's appropriate what's required within that environment whether that person discloses their alcoholic drug addicted autistic adhd blind in one eye ptsd it doesn't matter whether they use those words or feel comfortable because that's not necessarily relevant what's important is that you understand and have a put you have a relationship with that person in that time and that you can communicate about what are you bringing to the table what resources have you got what skills have you got what's the task at hand what are we here to do let's look at our let's look at our job descriptions how can we build a relationship together with what we both have at this time knowing that what we have at this time in terms of energy capacity you know enthusiasm for the job may change i may get annoyed with this job and want to go somewhere else but while i'm here this is what i've got and this is what we've got to work on that's what matters and i would like to see i mean after reading this i thought well you know it's kind of interesting and mm, whatever but ooh, it makes me feel a bit weird it gets weirder but that's that's my soapbox moments it's like we don't need to have training for this and tra like you'll be in training forever you'll have a day of training for everything and then somebody who's doesn't actually tick any of the boxes oh, i'm just a person they're gonna then want training about how do you just be you know what you can solve it all in one thing like i said people individual relationship building learn how to make friends learn how to be a good person learn how to not be a judgmental dick 
the the last bit I want to talk about in this community survey um, on working on autistic people in the workforce was what jobs can autistic people do? And um, again, because of my shoddy <laughs> lack of research, I don't really know whether there was a whole list of jobs and they, you know, rank them. I don't know how they did it. I could look it up. I might do before I do the notes. I might not. You know what? It's It's not that great of a survey. But these are the things that came up with. So what got a big tick was um, with about, you know, 70 odd, 60, 70, 65 percent and above people thought autistic people could do these jobs in whatever way they organized it. Artistic artist and musician. Good at that. Supported employment. Not sure what support whether that means across the board and what kind of supported it what what kind of support I just don't understand that one but I think if it's generous and it's saying autistic people could do any job as long as they're supported well that's kind of good I guess that is kind of good so that's up there too so artist musician was a clear winner behind that supported employment I'm gonna take that as a win for every any job they ever want to do that's within their capabilities and skill set as long as they've got a bit of support which not is nice wouldn't we all love that um, and then behind that is stacking shelves in a supermarket. They do like the idea of as autistic people being in supermarkets. I think they need to have a word for me. If I want, if I'm going to be put in a supermarket in this next universe of, of autistic friendliness, I really hope that they don't play rubbish music, that they don't have flickery, um, you know, those horrible overhead light things that they have. And um, stacking shelves, you know what, I'd be up for that. Yeah, fine. And that's what they want us to do, stack shelves. I, I like stacking shelves. I could, I could get behind that as a career. Um, but these other things, not so sure about. In fact, I think I'd be bloody good at stacking shelves. I'm really good at just doing the same. Like, I'm actually good at digging gardens as well. I can look at my garden from here. The next thing that they thought we'd be really good at is computer programming, which, yeah, I mean, I I was not surprised to see that in there. I'm surprised they didn't put engineer because that's another, you know, stereotypically autistic job, whether it's true or not. But computer programmer scores highly. So there's quite a bit of stuff going on there that people think we we can do. I'm not any of them, although I do have computer programming. Um, that was part of my degree. Um, but I preferred the chemistry because that's what I like. Um, what they thought we absolutely can't do um, is be a doctor or a lawyer. Being a doctor was my first choice of career up until I was... Um, <laughs> old enough to start taking exams and then I thought oh I'm not going to pass these exams to the level I need to to be a doctor I better get a career choice that's a bit easier um what I should have done um I'm not saying I would have been a good doctor or that that would have been a better career for me than what I'm chosen but I gave up on my dream really really easily because I was very black and white about the criteria for getting into uni and I'd heard that you need to get all A's and or or, or a B you know like in in all your sciences and at that time I was um going to be getting um lower than that you know c's and d's i was struggling i was struggling not because of a lack of um inherent intelligence and capacity for these things i would have been probably like a medical dictionary by now had i been a doctor but um it was all the other softer things like understanding what the teacher's saying what they want from us you know all those social skills that kind of come out as you get to those exam years so um and knowing what the question means in the way they've asked it and uh dealing with burnout and um peer pressure and competing understandings of things and all sorts of things so anyway i i, I would have liked to have been a doctor i don't regret not being a doctor but um Actually, no, I don't at all. I think this would have been this suits me better what I found, but I didn't I didn't choose this. It it sort of like morphed. I morphed it. And I probably could have done the same with doctory. Only had a doctor qualification to do it with. And then I'd I don't know, who knows? Who knows? That's that's for that's in case the universe where I'm a shop shelf stacker doesn't work out. I can be a doctor, which I can't do as an autistic person according to this. Lawyer, I've no idea where that one came from. I thought wouldn't wouldn't lawyer like these are these are real heavy 
information based maybe they're thinking about in court but that that's a mask you know like people lawyers have to have good masks if that's what they're thinking maybe they don't understand what a lawyer does I think a lot of lawyering is a bit like a lot of doctoring you've got to know a lot of stuff you've got to have a lot in your head be quite flexible in you know it's almost like a special interest and that's how I've done well in my career as a chemist I've got my special interest in this cosmetic chemistry and I nail it not always where they thought we might be able to give it a go, like a bit 50-50, member of parliament, labourer on a building site, waiter or waitress. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting turn events. One of my other <laughs> wanted to do jobs as a kid was being a prime minister. I grew up in England when Margaret Thatcher was the prime minister and I paid hardly any attention to her policies. I probably wouldn't have liked much about her um, now as an adult but um, at the time I thought it was fantastic that there was a woman, a woman socking it to the men in parliament and um, I particularly liked that and felt that I would also like to have that level of of power and people listening to me because I was a bit you know, hungry for that as a kid. I'm not now and I'm very glad I didn't pursue that as a dream because I think that would have drove me nuts, to be honest. Not so much the parliament, you know, and, and what it stood for and the lawmaking and all the rest of it, but more the the ridiculous office politics, which I'm going to get on to next. So yeah, people didn't really know. They were like, yeah, 50-50 for member of parliament, labour on a building site, waiter or waitress. Quite different jobs, quite different things. I don't know why they thought of that. I don't know whether much thought went into it, but for me, that's going to keep me guessing for hours. So what has work been like for me? I have been in continual employment or have had my own business for the whole of my career, except for some time when I was taking a bit of time out to move countries and have, um, and, and, and I had my baby, my second baby. I was, I saw myself as potentially the main breadwinner. Winner. I have had, um, for the majority of our married life, the higher salary of the two of us, the higher income when it's my own business. Um, and that, is a f is more factual than some a, a point of pride it's it's just how it is but along with being the main breadwinner and having the higher income comes a level of responsibility around setting the lifestyle tone setting the tone for the lifestyle so you know how much money can you borrow when you want to buy a house how much you know where do you send the kids to school how many hobbies do they do what do you commit to where do we go on holiday you know those extra things were um on my pile not exclusively because we're in a partnership and it comes together but being the one who was earning the the highest salary that extra money that goes above and beyond existing and maintaining the status quo the aspirational bit was was for me so my work relationship has been coming from that perspective as the main breadwinner um not um and and therefore it has come with a level of um taking it for the team, I guess, I'd like to say, um, because my needs, my comfort, my my desire to, you know, oh God, it's all too hard, I just want to have a rest, I just want to give up. It, it, it hasn't been within my control for a lot of my adult life because I started having children as soon, pretty much as soon as my career started. I only had two, but, um, you know, then once you've had them, they stay with you, <laughs> as kids do, which is great, um, until they get old enough to do their own thing. So um, there's that commitment. So that commitment's been there from day one. So my working life as a person has never been, up until this point, a solely autonomous experience. You know, I'll do what I like. I'll make it work for me. If this doesn't work, I'll move on. No, it's been burden, burdened is a good word because that's how it sometimes felt, although that then harbours resentment. But it but it has because the resentments often come from me. I set myself up as the main breadwinner because I knew I was intelligent. I knew I was good at stuff. I'm a good worker, blah, 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 blah. And I should, word, trigger word, I should be able to earn good money because of this and I did and I do sometimes now 
and that's where the journey goes. So I started off in offices, in corporate jobs, as a chemist, as a technical person, as a salesperson. So I was in sort of hybrid roles of technical sales, where I'd start off in the office and managing phone accounts and chemical imports and um, portfolios of ingredients to get out to clients and recommend things to them. And then that progressed quite quickly to being out on the road and making suggestions, helping them troubleshoot, introducing new things, running educational seminars and participating in that way. I took my career um, all over the country when I was back in England. So I was responsible for traveling all over the place and I enjoyed that actually. And then as my career progressed, it became international. So I had international responsibilities um, across Europe. And then when I moved to Australia, into Asia, um, responsibilities in, and relationships into Asia. That part of my journey where I was in the corporate world um, lasted around nine or so years and um, I learned a lot and um, including things about myself and, and I, I coped with it um, and I did well for my employees um, but I didn't do well for myself. I found it excruciating often not always there was a lot of good and I was very grateful for the opportunities and I did get to go on some brilliant business trips and at the time or when I was doing this I really loved that about my job I think that's what saved me because being in the office day to day on a time frame with all the noise and the chaos and the politics and everything I think that would have drained me so I was saved by the fact that I had a job that was heavily dependent on me getting out and about when I was in the UK, the culture back then, which was a while ago now, was happy with me working at home in between my visits. So that was helpful too, because I didn't have to work on someone else's body clock or time frame. And that was great because being who I am, I had no problem with motivating myself and getting up early in the morning and driving and then spending, sorry, spending the whole day doing my calls and then coming back late. So I would put a lot of effort in and I didn't need the extra just tick the box show up in the office and sit there so that we know you're doing stuff people didn't need to check on me that way they knew I was doing stuff you could they could see I was so what I think the benefits were that other no, other people noticed that's what I've gone for really because I mean the things that people noticed about me when I worked with them my bosses and the company in general and my work colleagues was that I was a hard worker um I was focused and determined I didn't really play into office politics. I ran my own race, basically. And that included everything, how I showed up physically, emotionally, and getting on with stuff. At the time, when I was doing this corporate work, I was very much trying to reach my full potential and thinking that any barrier, any hurdle that I came up against in terms of my ability to cope and deal versus, say, other people was my failing. I was very much thinking that I was flawed and that if only I learned some more skills like, you know, habits for successful people, I don't know, moving your cheese, whatever the books were they threw around. I took it as a personal failing or moral culpability that, that maybe if I tried harder, got more experience, did more work, that I would be better. Um, that wore off eventually, as things do when you realise it's not you. <laughs> but at the time, that's what I did. So I was uncomplicated in my communications. I was trustworthy. I was reliable. I wasn't afraid of hard things like troubleshooting and negotiations. I was often involved in negotiations um, and um, tough calls and dealing with clients and solving problems and calming people down afterwards because I could separate very easily, and I still can, my emotions or the emotionality from the facts, doing it in a fairly calm, detached way. And I was very, very good at that when I was working in corporate. It's harder for me now, actually, as an independent. I was very good at self, being self-motivated, good at timekeeping, good at accommodating others and motivating other people by setting a good example. I was also a good teacher and I was respectful, but I didn't fawn. So I wasn't the kind of person who would say yes to something in front of your face, a manager or someone else, and then know behind. I would listen and then process. And then if I had a problem, I would go and ask. 
So as I said, the downsides, you'd have to ask my bosses because there will be some, I'm sure, with everyone. But for me, where I struggled was in the more mundane parts of my job, such as organising samples, finishing, you know, end of month reports and, and things that that or filling out different, you know, there'd, there'd always be a different tool, spreadsheet, reporting system that we'd have to use. And quite, I'd do them and, and I would have no problem doing any of that if I felt that the information was going to be received, valued and then utilised in a way that made sense and that was benefiting the company. But so often I felt like it was a bit of box ticking um, and, and often was proved right because some people outside in, another, in other teams who, you know, they'd be like, oh, they don't have to do that because they just get it. It, it, yeah, there was a bit of that. And and that comes down to office culture and politics and what I was saying before about, you know, wouldn't it be nice if people just were nice and not dicks? So some of that got me down, plus um, the environment and routine. So the noise, the interruptions, the schedule, not being on my routine of work, you know, having to show up or else you're not working, um, no flexibility, that that sort of started to make me really, really tired. And there was there were a lot of times when I drive into work and, and, you know, have those moments where you don't know, you haven't remembered the journey or when I'm driving home feeling like I could nod off, spending a lot of the weekend in bed asleep or after, especially after taking the kids to their activities, coming home and just being completely wiped out. I was burning out and I couldn't cope with it anymore. Plus clothing was an issue for me. I did dress as professionally as I could do. I've said before, like as a woman, there's certain things that other women actually would judge me for, like not wearing high heel shoes, like wearing more sensible shoes. I mean, I'm a chemist, for goodness sake. I go in people's labs. I'm not going to traipse around in stilettos. You know, that's dangerous and impractical, but I do, I wouldn't do it anyway. Um, so yes, yeah, so after about nine years, I was a super tired and I left and I set up my own business. So this is my laboratory in a business that's called the company is called Selling Science. My business is called Realize Beauty, which is um, something that I believe in. I realize and recognize and celebrate the beauty in in all of all of the places that it is in the world. You know, whether that's in nature or in the chemistry that I do, in the relationships that I value, in, in anything really, it's, 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 any situation, there's always beauty. It's, it's, it's directing oneself towards the beauty. So that's what my business is called. And I've had my consulting, it's a chem chemistry consulting business. I've had this now for many years. Um, I think I set it up in 90, no, in 2007. So yeah, quite a while. It's, um, and, and it's, I didn't know I was autistic then. I set this business up, I left corporate because I was burning out and it was becoming obvious that it wasn't quite right for me and my young family. I thought having my own business would help me be more balanced as a person and be more available to my children and more able to pick them up and do things with them, which it did. It served me very well there. Um, not perfectly because there were still responsibilities and tasks I had to do in my business that took me away sometimes, um, sometimes overseas, but less so in my own business than before. But um, definitely mentally, you know, there's still a big burden when you have your own business. You might be in the office at home, which I have an office in my house, but you're not necessarily available to play Lego or do something. I do remember one night when I started laminating the chicken breast instead of the notes that I was going to present the next day. So I did struggle with, with that sort of changing tasks, monotropism as well, autism. But I set up my own business and I set about trying to create a work-life balance that worked for me, even though I didn't know I was autistic. And it did work. It started to work well and it actually took off really well. I ended up after a couple of years of, of plugging away and not really getting that far, I finally got some work and then I got a few more contracts. And before you knew it, three years in, I was up and running and earning some good money. When I say good money, it doesn't matter how much, but I was heading towards the kind of salary that I'd left my corporate my corporate job, which I was really happy with. And I was able to buy my first company car, which I actually still have. We've actually bought newer cars since this one, but this is, I'm going to drive this one till it, till it's not a, a drivable anymore because it means, it meant so much to me. And plus I've got so far now that I may as well see it out. It's, I got a Volkswagen Jetta. That's what I got. Um, and, and I still love that car. So everything was going well on one aspect. 
not in others. I found that having my own business helped me get a better balance in my life, recover from the stresses, manage my environment and my external stresses. What it didn't help with is the relational element. Sure, I don't have an office full of people and politics and bosses changing direction, but I do have a list of customers who will make demands, make changes, not understand what I'm saying, not want to understand potentially what I'm able to do or whatever, maybe not communicate clearly what they need. So the relational difficulties continued into my consulting business. That said, I can now sit here with a decent 13 odd years behind me saying some of the clients that I had in the early days of my consulting in the first few years are still with me now. I didn't escape, didn't create the perfect job for myself where all of the problems of the working world disappeared. What I did was gain some more control potentially over my thing, but I also took on a lot more responsibility because along with doing my day job of being a chemist, creating content, creating recipes and formulas and teaching, I also had to manage my finances and the budget and my wages and the taxes and sample stock I have to order all these materials and keep an inventory and turn things over and do the cleaning and still be the mom I had to do and meet customers expect you have to do it all so in some ways having my own business was harder than working for a boss if you're working for a boss in a corporation in whatever and you're not getting on with or you don't really understand or don't really like your management You have two choices. You either stay or you leave. And then you have choices after that. So if you decide to stay, well, it's like, well, what are you going to do to manage your emotional response or your ability to meet this employee? You know, how much are you going to fight? How much are you going to flee? How much are you going to do? Whatever. And you can go through that. But at the end of the day, you're still going to get paid unless you can't stay there anymore. You're going to get paid. When it's your own business, if you've got customers that are getting angry because you haven't done something or maybe your capacity is not good so something you said would take uh, your planning's not good so you might have said it would take you three weeks and it takes you 10 weeks and they're not happy with that all of that rests on your shoulders and you're not going to get paid I had this idea as this person with a lot of capacity my own business now I have I can make good money in in you know no time at all if I need to I wanted to elevate our lives to not just surviving but but also thriving giving our children choices and opportunities and for me to also feel what it feels to run what I class as a successful business that did often result in pain, emotional pain for me, problems, like I said, around relationships, around my capacity. I used to, I I still do probably, I would drop and break my lab equipment and that would cost me a lot of money because sometimes when I'm overwhelmed, I, I lose the capacity to hold things. You know, I literally have a thought come in my head and my hands let go of something and it might be my expensive homogenizer machine behind me. Um, And a couple of times I've dropped things and it's cost me hundreds of dollars, sometimes even thousands of dollars. So what I have enjoyed about having my own business is, like I said, being able to set my schedule to be able to work from home at least some of the time, to have some recovery time, to manage my environment and make it stimulating and nice for me. What I've struggled with in my business is exactly the same as what I did when I was in corporate. Well, not exactly, but but similar. And that's, again, personal relationships because or, or relationships in general and holding boundaries and knowing when enough's enough. Um, that has become easier now. I know I'm autistic because now I know that it's not my moral failing that I'm not constantly trying to make people happy. Well, what if I do this? What I do in my early days in my career is that if somebody if a customer wasn't happy with a formula I did or they think oh I don't really like it can you try I'd just keep trying and I'd end up trying and having like 20 30 different goes at it when the industry standards probably three to five even sometimes only two times so I was putting in a lot of effort for the same reward in terms of my working life um what is the point of sharing this with you well it really is just a story it's just a story of how things go of how how people in this survey feel autistic people should show up in the workplace where they might show up and what what if any support they should be offered 
versus me who's been constantly working my whole life, adult life, and even before that I had part-time jobs as a kid. I've always been quite motivated to have my own financial independence. I, it's been one of, along with parenting, having a working life, having a company has been extremely difficult and challenging for me. The responsibilities of being the extra, if you like, or the, the, the dominant breadwinner, so to pay the bills and the lifestyle, or at least contribute a bit, a fair bit to that lifestyle, has been, it, it has nearly broke me on a number of occasions. I have been so tired, especially when I um, probably got overexcited and overextended myself um, in terms of putting the kids in private schools or schools of their choice and then committing to other things and we, we did have a few um, years where life was difficult for me. Um, I'm not uh, difficult for everyone, but I found it difficult to keep up mentally with my responsibilities. But, but I did, um, and I'm sure that it has cost me, um, and now I'm trying to recover from that. That's all I want to say, really, is that don't lose yourself in it but also don't lose opportunities because of who you are or how you show up. If you want to do something, if you want to be something, if you want to work in a certain area or explore something, go for it and find, try and find a way to do it that, that, that does centre and, and um, centre your, your health, that you can do it for your health. I set up my company because it was centering my health and my family's well-being it still meant me carrying a burden and the burden was as big as in corporate, but it was a different site. It had different contents. Con yeah, it was different. So it was just as annoying and bad and upsetting, but it was in a different way. I didn't realize that's how it would be, but that's how it would be. But now looking back and me still being in my business, I'm very grateful because that's been a great opportunity. And yeah, now with this blogging and whatever, it's just useful to be able to share that with people and hopefully it's meaningful in some way.